My name is Adi Berlinkov. I have experience of 12 years in cybersecurity. Before moving, moving to cybersecurity, I worked as software engineering for seven years. Hi, my name is Roy Sherman. I'm the field CTO for Mitiga. Uh, I was doing offensive security for the last decade, and now I moved to defensive. I have a bachelor's degree in information security uh, and a master's degree in criminology because I have a thing for bad guys. Um, part of the B-Sites Tel Aviv organizing team and amateur home brewer. Let's start. When we talk about the cloud, it doesn't just the cloud provider. We also include any system or application that provides services in the cloud. You can see here the trends in the SaaS market. The number of the SaaS companies and end user uh, spending on public cloud services is ex expected to increase, which why we are focusing on our attackers are adopting their strategy on cloud attacking. There are several good, uh, thank you, thank you. There's uh, several good reasons why company moving to the cloud. Companies can reduce spending on purchasing and management uh, hardware. The maintenance, it's much easier. Uh, it's allow organization to adopt new technologies. Uh, the time, the time do downtime is very low and enable businesses easily to, uh, to scale their resources up or down based on current needs. However, it's important to note that security is not one of the reasons to behind this shift. The number of attacks on the cloud also increased. Those systems have become attractive targets for attacker. They, uh, very, uh, the very large volume of sensitive data and critical businesses processes being handled by SaaS application make them high value targets. Cloud ap application are internet facing, which make it easier for attacker to find weaknesses and exploit vulnerabilities compared to on-premise on application that are protected by additional layer security, such as firewall or VPNs. Uh, let's talk about uh, this uh, use case. Uh, it's very familiar. Uh, Russian cyber group called Midnight Blizzard attacked Microsoft by using password sparing attack to access a legacy non-production uh, test tenant accounts that didn't have MFA enable. And moving to the main Microsoft corporate production tenant, and by that, uh, they access to internal uh, systems and also source code. If you're not familiar with uh, what is a password spraying attack, it's a type of brute force attack. So it means that all the attacks that perform over there are very known, known uh, simple, and very easy. Everything was cloud only. Microsoft are a big cloud provider and still miss this for months, like you can see over there. Microsoft invests a lot of information in a lot of information security, but still had a misconfiguration issue in the cloud. Uh, as I already know, that uh, both companies and attackers move to the cloud. Now, let's see the differences between clouds, uh, attack and defense, and, uh, defense and uh, defenses. Uh, what is the difference between cloud and on-prem? You can see here that attacks are much easier on the cloud and uh, defense are more challenging. This table shows high level overview of the differences. Sherman will drive in uh, each or one of them. 
All right. So we see that even big companies like Microsoft still struggle both with the basic security in their cloud, even though they are one of the main cloud service providers. And we can also see that attackers keep focusing on cloud. We had Snowflake very recently, which was only a, a cloud only attack. Um, but we'll start with the attacker POV, which is my favorite POV, to be honest, to go through each one of the items we mentioned, each one of those topics, to talk a bit about how it looks from both the attacker and the defenders. So from the required skill set perspective, we know that when you attack an on-prem environment or technology, you have a lot of the basic computer knowledge required, like basic networking, subnetting, um, how things work, protocols, SMB, NTLMs. You need to even have a basic understanding on how to compile and run exploits. Everybody that went through the OSCP uh, courses saw that we struggle a bit until we figure out how it works. We have ExploitDB. Now we have Gen AI and all those fancy things, but still, you need to have some sort of basic knowledge and understanding how things work before you can come in and start breaking them apart. You have a lot of technology you need to learn how to bypass. One of the most common uh, topics discussed today for red teamers is how to bypass EDRs. You have whether it's unhooking and other different types of techniques and almost every other week somebody comes out with a new tool or a new technique uh, against EDR. And eventually, even if you're targeting the database of a company on-prem or their application or whatever, it works on a computer or a server that has an operating system. So whether those are Linux or Windows based, you still have an uh, operating system you can either target or interact and try to fight with. On the other side in cloud, everything has a UI. Everything has a portal, fancy buttons you can click. You don't need to have very deep internal knowledge on how those services work or operate if you want to interact with them. So if you want to download an entire AWS bucket, you just have a checkbox you mark and click download. That's super easy. Also, everything is available over APIs because cloud was made to make uh, IT lives easier. When you want to orchestrate stuff, when you want to deploy things, everything has an API. So interacting with it is very straightforward, has very good documentation. And we have wide uh, misconfigurations that are super common. I'm personally familiar with over 20 different open source tools that target AWS buckets or Azure storage accounts or GCP storage. All of them target the same things, publicly accessible with anonymous access that you can do pretty much everything. So from, we mentioned a few tools, and, and that's the thing. Tools are something easy to burn or to mark as a defender. You either get signatures, you either get how they operate on on-prem, what they target, what they do, what they execute. So from a defense perspective, Mimikatz probably gets an update twice a day today, but still, we get those signatures from our defense tooling and our security structure. We also have the C2 frameworks, but those now come with a cost. Some of them are open source, which are a bit harder to maintain, harder to use if you're less experienced. But if you want the top tier, you need to pay money. And it's not very easy because those when you pay and you need to have a license, they try to crack down on the uh, threat actors that are using them for malicious purposes, which makes it harder for criminals to obtain them unless they go for the pirated version, which usually is much less secure for them. But for us, the, the red teamers, the pen testers, we have Mimikatz, which is commonly available and everybody already knows how to use it. We have the end day exploit. So when CV comes out, usually in a few days, you'll have a walking exploit somewhere and you have those frameworks that collect all of those exploits. So whether it's Metasploit for the, the legacy folks out there, but also other options. In cloud, it's very hard to defend against those tools because you don't really have a hash. You don't know when somebody is running a specific tool against your infrastructure because, as we mentioned, everything is tied to the API. So those tools to attack cloud are basically somebody that's coding how to interact with specific APIs in a specific order to automate those types of activities. And as an attacker, you don't really need or, or use a zero day or an end day unless you are a, a state nation or something like that because you don't really need it and it will target the actual infrastructure, which is much harder to exploit and compromise rather than specific services that probably are misconfigured by your uh, victim. The security tech stack, 
So a lot of acronyms, I'm sorry. That's the industry we live in. But um, in on-prem, we have many. We have the EDRs for the endpoints. We have IPS and IDSs for network, NAC for the physical connection, uh, internal firewalls for segmentation. We have bidirectional firewalls. We have a lot of different technology that we are already familiar with. A lot of the companies already bought over 100 different types of security tooling for their on-prem. We're in cloud, we're only starting. So we are all familiar with a CSPM because they almost sold for Google for like $23 billion. But we have some common acronyms. To be honest, we're doing cloud for a living. We don't remember all of them. I had to Google some of them to put them in the slide of, of what they actually mean. But the common theme for at least the, third, the, the top three of them, it's security configuration. They look at how are you configured and not how you are actually ready to do something, detect something, or respond to something. The last category, the TDIR and the CDR, are looking at that portion to see, all right, we have the configuration thing sorted out-ish, and now we need to see what we do for actual uh, active defense. And the perimeter. That's something everybody already heard of, that the new perimeter in cloud is identity. It's a cliche, it's funny, but it's still true. Because when you want to get your initial access and you want to compromise a company or target their own prem uh, infrastructure, you need to get a foothold within the environment. So whether it's phishing and you need to land with a malware on the host, or phishing for credential and you need to find a way to remotely connect, whether it's Citrix, VPN, any type of remote connection into the company, or you can find a vulnerability with one of their uh, external footprints. So whether it's an unpaid service, a shadow IT, somebody forgot about, or something you need to compromise. Or for some of us, that's the favorite way, physically get into their offices, plug something into the network, and then you have that access. So you have that actual step of breaking sort of a boundary in order to get into the company. So it's not necessarily more difficult, but it's still more work. And we already know that hackers are lazy. That's what makes us good at what we do. So we'll try to have the least amount of uh, in, um, investment on our side to get the biggest amount of uh, value. In cloud, all you need is identity. And it doesn't really matter if it's a human identity, like username and password and MFA fatigue or no MFA. Um, or just a non-human credential, an API key, somebody forgot in one of the commits in GitHub, or anything you managed to get from a different company. At the end of it, we'll talk about a different, another use case where a company was breached using a non-human identity, and then what was stolen from them are a bunch of non-human identities for their customers, which makes this cycle much more uh, vicious. So attackers stopped from breaking in, we started to log in. And talking about detection, so as we mentioned, where we talk about on-prem, we already know sort of what's suspicious. So, sorry? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so everything that interacts with LSAS that's not common, we already know it's weird, it's suspicious, it's something we want to look at, it's something we want to block. Um, we have the signatures we mentioned, we have the old technology, all right, NTLM, or in some cases, LM. Um, we have technology designed to identify when exploits are running through the network. Um, fancy ways for exfiltrating information, whether it's DNS that's uncommon, anomalies, stuff that's out of pattern. In cloud, every activity the attacker takes is the same activity as an admin or developer would take. The only difference would be their intention. And currently, it's very, very hard to build detections for intent. Because in the end of the day, you might have anomalies, but every organization is different. And as a defender, you also want something that's tailor made for your organization. But when you work with a community, everything has to be generic so everybody can adopt it. So it makes it much uh, harder for us to improve our detections in the cloud because somebody replicates a cloud or a storage account. We don't know if it's an attacker replicating it for an unplanned backup they're going to do for us, or it's an actual IT guy doing their own backup routines. People adding integration apps, whether it's Slack, uh, code repositories, whatever we have today that's integrated with SaaS, whether it's something they want, need, and approve to do, 
or is it something an attacker puts in to have additional access to our infrastructure? Somebody spinning up huge GPU instances in the cloud, they might be playing with generative AI, they might mining uh, cryptocurrency. We need to figure out which use case is it. And of course, the creation of non-human identities. We have developers building CI CD pipelines, so building automations, but we also have attackers creating backdoors and persistency for themselves. So we had all how it looks from the attacker perspective, but we're here to talk about also about defense. So same structure, same things, but from the defense perspective. So technology in on-prem didn't really change much. So everybody talks about Gen AI, post-quantum encryption, um, whatever, nothing really changed. We're already familiar with the architecture of how companies are built. So they might be a little bit different but the core concepts are still the same. All of us are familiar with a, uh, Active Directory lateral movement, privilege escalation, common attacks, bloodhound, attack paths, all of those things. We monitor for specific event IDs. If you take a blue teamer that's doing this for a couple of years and you ask them, wait, what's the event ID for uh, uh, account lockout or a Kerberos ticket being extracted or anything like that, they know all of those numbers from the top of their head. We have common and shared SIM queries and playbooks very easy to, inter to investigate, to match against. But in cloud, it's, it's very different. When a bucket leaks out, that's a fancy code of unwanted access. And it's very hard to determine, all right, does it actually leaking or we wanted it to be accessible? What's the architecture when you talk about the cloud footprint? Because different companies use different clouds. Some of them are multi-cloud resources might be for the same purpose, but they are built and inter uh, interconnected in a different way. So it's much harder for the defenders to figure out how, how our architecture looks like and should that service communicate with that service on the cloud? Are they related? Uh, is it something on the back end from our providers? And of course, when we want to start an IR and we know the attacker access the SaaS platforms. So in this case, let's take HR and let's assume they change the payroll uh, details on a bunch of employees. We don't control that app. We don't host it. We don't have the operating system logs on it. And now we're depending on a third party that might have the logs or not. They might lie about, about having the logs. And then we can figure out what really happened. And in the end of the day, when you build a playbook and you build it for a Windows OS or a Linux OS or something within your on-prem, it's very generic. You can use it across the board. But when you build something for AWS, it won't work with GCP. And it also won't work with Azure and won't work with any other provider, especially not with any SaaS platforms. So some of the common figured out security for defense we already have. So for on-prem, we have IOCs, we have hashes, we have signatures. We mentioned that a lot of times so far, but we have also Sigma, Yara, Snow Tools. We have things that are already out of the box or require a bit of customization. We can isolate resources and host using our EDR. We can patch vulnerabilities when they come out, usually. Um, but in cloud, we are much more limited. From an IOC perspective, we have IPs and domains because we don't really have malware running on our own resources. We might have some threat actors. If somebody works for a threat intel company, I'm sorry, don't come at me, that, that's the truth. But we have IOAs, indicators of activity, as we mentioned. So we know somebody is doing something, but is it a bad thing? Is it a, a routine? Or is it just somebody doing something they shouldn't do? We can't really isolate resources. We can take them down, we can limit access, but it's not really isolation and it's not centralized the way we have it on-prem. And of course, we can't really patch. If a CVE comes in for the infrastructure for AWS or Azure, we're fucked. <laughs> um, for security tax tech, so as we mentioned, from, we have a lot of acronyms again, but all of them sort of makes sense because on-prem, on, on they work together, they're interconnected, they're centralized. It's easier to see everything in the same place or at least most of it in the same place. In cloud, we have a problem. So we have logs, they are never real time. In best case, they are near real time because stuff happens, then your vendor, your cloud security provider, sorry, your cloud provider needs to process them 
generate them, and then ship them to your own sim. And that takes time. So in some cases, signing logs, which are critical logs in most cases, will take at least 15 minutes before they uh, populate in your environment. So that's super difficult. And the visibility, which is one of before the last piece, we have on-prem, we can enable policy across the board. Easy, we build it once, run it everywhere. Same structure for the logs. So event logs from every operating system, so every Windows operating system will look the same, have the same structure, the same content. Everything's figured out, common types. Whatever we use, we know it's the same everywhere. In cloud, first of all, most of the logs are turned off by default because they cost money. And when you want to enable them, you need to understand what you're enabling, where you're enabling it, and to enable it everywhere. So in AWS, for example, when you enable something, it's only in the region unless you go and do it everywhere. It's not super easy or straightforward, unfortunately, and it's something that's usually being missed. And the content of the logs and the structure is very different. So AWS logs looks very different from Azure logs that look different from GCP logs because those are almost non-existent. Um, and SAS, does SAS have logs? Most of them claim they do. Then you go for an IR and they start like saying, yeah, we are working on it. Let us like come back in a week or so when we can. In other cases, and in this case Slack and Microsoft, I'm looking at you, it's blocked based on your license level. So if you're using the basic tiers for licensing in some of those SaaS platforms, you don't have logs available for you in any case. And for the last piece, our responsibilities, accountabilities, all of that structure. So in on-prem, we know who is going to do what. We can yell at each other afterwards that they did a poor job, but we know who should do what. So it's much easier between IT security, cybersecurity, SOC, SecOps, whatever. Usually they also have administrative access so they can either go within the network or isolate using their own tooling. Every time something new, gets spun up on your environment on-prem, it automatically gets your security policies or your SOC package, basically. In cloud, a lot of different teams. Dev team, DevOps, DevSecOps, SecOps, SOC. Nobody really knows who doing what, where, and when. The SecOps doesn't have administrative access. They don't manage the cloud. That's different teams. And then when they want logs enabled, they ask a different team that's not a security team. Those are clicking a few buttons and nobody really knows if it was configured correctly. And of course, again, we don't have any control about cloud recess vulnerabilities. So if tomorrow, Slack, Monday, Workday, Snowflake has a problem, which is a vulnerability, we can't patch it for them. We have to wait for them to figure it out. So just to wrap it up, another use case I want to go through, and this was what happened with Sysons. So basically, somebody bad managed to compromise one of their GitLab accounts, which got them code access, and there they found a non-human identity. They used that to go into their AWS S3 bucket and steal all of that, which is terabytes of information, and Sysons are serving hundreds, if not thousands of customers, and within this bucket, they had more access keys for other companies, which make this go round and round and round, and now targeting a lot of other companies. And those, com those companies need to figure out, all right, which credentials we had with Sysons? Can we map those against our environment? Can we see which activities and actions they carried out? Do we know which time frame? Because it came out in April, but we don't know where the actual breach occurred, or we cannot be certain of it. And the only recommendation coming out, out of this, whether it's CISA or Sison CISO or whatever, was to rotate your credentials. So it basically was a simple attack. Somebody got access to something. No vulnerabilities, no exploit, no zero day, uh, no nation state attackers, nothing fancy. But in the end of the day, somebody got credentials, it's a non-human credential, got terabytes of information with more credentials, and now we need to figure it out. So to wrap up, few, I would say, recommendations from us to you. So next week, work on that visibility we mentioned, because we know we don't have logs and we don't have good visibility. We might have logs available that we do not collect or not enabled, or if they're enabled, we need to make sure they're enabled across the board, all regions, all cloud providers, 
all SaaS platforms that we already use, we might don't see it in the configuration, so it's worth reaching out and asking them, do you have security logs? Because in a lot of cases, they will have sort of application slash debug logs, which are less effective for security. And next month, try to see how you can enable security tooling available from your provider. So AWS has GuardUty, Azure has Security Center and Microsoft Defender for Cloud, GCP has the Google Cloud Security Command Center. Gee, that's long. Um, I don't know if all of them are free, depends on tier, licenses, whatever. Check it. If you have it available, start using it. They generate some of the alerts you want to see as a starting point, and then you can expand on doing all right. Uncover your unknown unknown, which is another cliche I hate, but it's still true. Get a red team, a good red team, to start breaking things. And then when you can see what they broke and you don't know where they went when they got into that specific sales platforms, that's a visibility gap you want to address. And then start building your anomaly detection and your behavioral detections. That means that we said we can detect tools. However, if you have a tool, you can start seeing how it's structured, which API it calls, in which uh, way, method, which time frame between each call. It helps with detections. It won't solve security, unfortunately, uh, but it's still something better for your cloud environment. Thank you for having us.